Hi, my name is Deborah schmidt Lobis. I am a pianist, uh, teacher, and composer in the Boulder, Colorado area. And I'm here to talk a bit about a concert that's upcoming this summer with the Colorado Music Festival. It's a concert with Awadajan Pratt. That's a name for you. Awadajan Pratt, uh, who will be playing uh, music of Jesse Montgomery, a very spectacular piece called Rounds. Um, he will be playing Bach, a major uh, piano concerto, and uh, orchestra will be playing Scherzad by Rinsky Korsakoff. Uh, this concert is July 25th at 7.30 p.m. and July 26th at 6.30 p.m. So notice the time difference. And um, I'm excited about this concert because I love Awa Dajin Pratt. I'm going to call him Mr. Pratt because it's a, it's a hard name to pronounce. And I also love the music of the composer Jesse Montgomery. And of course, I love Bach and Rimsky Korsakoff. What's not to love? So um, I want to talk a bit about uh, Awa Dajin Pratt. Uh, before I get into uh, the actual concert uh, material. He's one of those pianists who is really known for being insightful and intense. And he has been a pianist uh, most of his life. He started studying actually violin when he was six years old. And then they moved to Illinois. He, he grew up in, well, he started out in Pittsburgh moved to Illinois, went to um, University of Illinois when he was 16, and then went to Peabody after that. He was the first African-American, actually the first person to graduate with three diplomas in piano, violin, and conducting. So uh, that's quite a feat. He's one of those, uh, definitely a prodigy. Okay. Um, in 1992, he won uh, the, the piano competition, the Nomberg, which is quite a big deal. And a couple of years later, he won the Avery Fisher, Fisher uh, grant. And that that's a big deal. He's played everywhere from Kennedy Center to uh, the White House, to Chicago's Symphony Hall, New Jersey Performing Arts Center, New York Phil, Minnesota Orchestra, Pittsburgh. And he's also played at the Colorado Symphony, and I saw him there several years ago. He was fabulous. Summer appearances are in places like Ravinia, Blossom, Wolf Trap, Caramore, Aspen, Hollywood Bowl. And this summer, of course, he's going to be at the Colorado Music Festival in Boulder. Wonderful thing. He's also been on many TV shows, interviews, that kind of things, and He's even been on Sesame Street and played with Big Bird. So it's one of the highlights of his career. He, he said he really learned how to share making music when he played with Big Bird. So um, he's quite an interesting man. He uh, conducts as well. Um, he's been conducting several orchestras in Japan. He's done Winston-Salem, Santa Fe Symphonies, Northwest Sinfonietta, and uh, upcoming activities are going to be with the Chamber Orchestra of Pittsburgh. And he's going to be conducting performances of Porgy and Bess with the Greensboro Opera. So the great thing that I think is amazing about him and also about our composer who he's playing the music of, Jesse Montgomery, they're both serious educators. He's really renowned for performing on, uh, and doing workshops in colleges and universities and also doing things with kids. Uh, one thing about him that I find fascinating and fun, and when I saw him, I noticed it, uh, he always wears something very colorful. So say he wears a colorful shirt, black pants, and always socks of color, socks that go with that shirt. And I've seen him also perform in black, but also with the socks. So watch for that. It's just kind of a funny thing he does. And I think it makes him a hit with the young people 
um, he has recorded a lot. He's done a lot of uh, projects. He's recorded Bach. He's recorded Beethoven. He's recorded Brahms, uh, piano and cello, sonatas, et cetera. I mean, he could walk in anywhere, any studio in the world probably, and record uh, one of the old war horses or do whatever he chose to do. However, he has not recorded in 12 years, and who knows why. But about five years ago, he started working on a project. And because he has done so much educating of uh, young people, he has uh, made friends, let's just say, all over the world. And he has a lot of people um, commissioning him, let's just say, commissioning him to uh, do a CD project. That CD project ended up being called Still Point. And for that, he had some prerequisites. He wanted all African-American composers, and they needed all to be into T.S. Eliot's four quartets. Now, those are kind of serious poems, but that was part of his uh, reasoning and bringing these people together, a unifying factor. And when I talk a bit about Jesse Montgomery, the composer, of rounds, um, I'll I'll read a little bit of one of those for you. He had um, brought together many orchestras, for instance, St. Louis, Milwaukee, Baltimore, all these at Colorado Symphony. There's about nine different symphonies that have helped with this commission of Still Point. And Jesse, of course, Montgomery was one of those composers uh, with that. And uh, the great thing about it, I've listened a bit to it. It's just unbelievable. It's recorded with um, a room full of teeth. Room full of teeth is kind of a, a it's a vocal ensemble, a very unique vocal ensemble. Um, and the stringed orchestra, or chamber orchestra called A Far Cry. So it's recorded with strings and recorded with um, vocals. And all these six composers have different takes on this poetry of, of Eliot's, and uh, it's really wonderful. Um, as far as Mr. Pratt, I could really go on and on about him because he has a million accolades. People love him everywhere, and I think he will enjoy his playing of everything. Uh, I wanna say a couple words about the Bach he's playing. He's playing an A major keyboard concerto. The BWV number on it is 1055, in case you want to look it up, because there's recordings out of it. Um, in the period of time it was written, in like about 1738, there weren't much in the way of keyboard concertos that Bach had written, or at that time it would have been harpsichord concertos. Harpsichord was usually thought of as part of the continuo accompaniment to another instrument playing a solo, like the oboe, the flute, the violin. Um, this particular concerto was probably written for oboe or oboe de more. Oboe de more is um, probably a little bit bigger of an instrument than an oboe, just a wee bit, probably a bit mellower sound. So, the hypothesis is that Bach's son, one of his sons probably made this into a keyboard concerto at some point, and that's probably who played it first as a keyboard concerto. But I don't know that it's done much. I noticed that Boston Symphony had premiered it with Mr. Pratt in 2022, and they had never played it before that. So uh, again, I would encourage you to possibly get online and listen to Mr. Pratt playing everything from Bach to Beethoven to Brahms and everything in between, especially from his new recording, Still Point, because he's truly, truly a fine, uh, fine musician. So I want to talk a little bit about Rounds. Uh, Rounds is, of course, by Jesse Montgomery. 
she had an interesting background. She was born in 1981. And she was born to parents. Her father, they were musicians. He was a musician. They're artists. Her mother was a theater kind of storyteller, performance type person. And they they uh, lived in Manhattan's Lower East Side. So she began playing music and being involved with all kinds of arts at a very young age. In fact, when she was 10, she went to a, a place called the Third Street Music School. And that school was built in 1894 and is still around. It's like a community uh, music school. So that's probably where she wrote her first quartets. She also played a little clarinet and wrote some things for orchestra. Um, in the meanwhile, her parents were very involved politically. They were activists. And so she got to go to rallies and performances and storytelling and those kind of things. And I, I think that electric, eclectic, not electric, eclectic culture that she grew up in really kind of gave her a perspective on composing. She's a very, very interesting woman. She's a fabulous violinist herself and has been um, working with a group called Sphinx for many years. Sphinx organization uh, supports and encourages young African-American and Latinx string instrumentalists. So she has not only played with them and performed as a soloist and in chamber music situations, but she's written a lot for them and also for all kinds of chamber orchestras, uh, the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, American Composers Orchestra, Atlantis, Atlantic Symphony, to name a few. Um, so when uh, she had known Mr. Pratt before this opportunity to write for his still point came around, but she had never written a piano concerto or much for piano. So they had to collaborate a wee bit. And there's a moment in the recording I heard of still point where she has an improvisory, improvisatory moment for him. He actually plucks inside of the piano and it's, it's really cool. The piece itself um, she would call it a rondo within a rondo within a rondo. And for those of you music aficionados, um, you know what a rondo is. If you don't, it means basically a section A and a section B, then a section A, a section C, section A may be back to B or on to D, always coming back around. So the rounds piece really is very circular in feel. And uh, it's just a really beautiful and cool piece. But uh, I want to talk a bit about her sense of things because it's kind of cool how she got into writing for this. As I said, she she um, had had not written for piano. So what got her, I think, was the poetry that he had chosen. She's really she kind of delves into the yin and yang of life, of music in general. Um, there's that feeling of action, reaction, dark and light, you know, black and white, that kind of thing. And um, I'm going to quote here a little bit. She, she delved into the work of biologist and philosopher Andreas Weber, or Weber, Weber who writes about the interdependency of all beings, to slow down, to listen, to observe both the effect and the opposite effect caused by every single action and moment. So it gets kind of deep, but it's kind of cool. So I'm going to read you a bit of that poetry that has so inspired her and obviously Mr. Pratt. At the still point of the turning world, neither flesh nor fleshless, neither from nor towards. At the still point, there the dance is. But neither arrest nor movement, and do not call it fixity where past and future are gathered. Neither movement from nor towards, neither ascent nor decline, except for the point, the still point. There would be no dance, and there is only the dance. You can see it's 
kind of deep. It's it's not easy to understand this poetry at all, but um, obviously, Miss Jessie Montgomery enjoyed it. She's um, been known when she was back at that school. Uh, she did a lot of uh, multimedia sorts of things. She earned a bachelor's degree in violin performance, but in 2012, she completed a master's degree in composition for film and multimedia from the New York University. So that same year, 2012, she wrote a piece for quartet that has become, uh, it was really her first professional commission. It's called Strum, which I believe we heard last year at CMF. Uh, and it was commissioned by the Community M Music Works in New York, but it's become her most played piece. People love, love that piece. So it's become very popular. Um, she's got a million accolades. She has played, she's a founding member of the Public Quartet, Thelmer member of Providence and Catalyst Quartets. And She's really a very sought out violinist herself, as well as a music educator. Um, she's very interesting to read about. But we need to move on because we have to talk about Rimsky-Korsakov a bit, because he's the last number on the show. Um, if you're not familiar with Russian composers, there's a whole group of composers, five, they call them the five, who composed in Russia um, in about the 1850s, 60s, 70s, 80s in there. Um, Rimsky-Korsakov was, in fact, born in 1944 and became a part of this group. But he was more of an orchestrator who, for instance, Mussorgsky redid and re-edited and reorchestrated things many times. And Rimsky Korsakov was more somebody to help him do that. He also worked uh, on works of boarding after he passed away. But through all that, he really found his own voice. And if you know anything about those Russian five big composers, they're very into creating nationalistic Russian folkloric kinds of music. And, uh, you know, it's all about Imperial Russia and all of that. So as Rimsky-Korsakov Rimsky found his own voice, he loved folkloric things. And he found something that he wanted to create beautiful music to. And that's the story of Scheherazade. Now, if you've never heard much about Scheherazade, I'm going to tell you that story in a minute. But suffice it to say... At that point in time in Russia, they were very fascinated with Asian music and Indian music and folk tales from those countries. And I think he was looking to make something kind of fun and interesting. He actually uh, is taking Middle Eastern and Indian folk tales known as Thousand and One Nights or the Arabian Nights. So this was storytelling. It, it's kind of a uh, the program program music of the era, and um, he wrote this piece in 1988. It was performed that year in Saint Petersburg, and he himself conducted it. the The reviews were great. They called it dazzling, colorful orchestration, Asian interest. And it figured greatly in that Russian imperialistic sense of things. Um, some of its themes are kind of interesting. It was actually, re well, it was used, uh, became a ballet in 1903 in Paris. Actually, it wasn't 1903, it was 1910. Uh, it became a ballet, and the ballet Russe performed it. Now, uh, Najinsky danced it, and Fulkin was the choreographer. And here we have this story, this very sensual story, which I'm going to tell you about in a moment. But at that point in time, the choreography that they did was not exactly sensual. And this uh, particular piece um, 
they they created this very kind of stimulating and sensual piece on on stage, which of course the music aided in. But um, I'd love to see that ballet because I think it it started it it wasn't starting like uh, you know like Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, but I'm sure there are many people out there protesting. So, and Shahrazad, the Sultan vows to take a new wife every night, but he executes her the next morning. So here comes this new wife, Shahrazad, but she keeps him engaged with this connective storytelling every night for a thousand and one nights. That's why it's called, obviously, a thousand and one nights or Arabian nights. Um, in the in the music, you hear the sultan uh, being really portrayed by low strings and woodwinds. And it's kind of a foreboding feeling when you hear it. But Shahrazad is always in these upper beautiful upper strings, lovely strings, and it comes back into the piece many times. It has four movements. And originally, Rimsky-Korsakov did not name them any other thing other than Allegro, Andante, that sort of thing. But one of his students, Lyotov, decided it needed atmospheric names. So he used names like Sea and the Sinbad's Ship and the Young Prince and the Young Princess and Festival at Baghdad and the ship goes to pieces on a rock, you know, some uh, atmospheric types of names. But there's really only four movements. And throughout those four movements, we hear again and again the lovely violin of uh, the lyrical solo voice of Scheherazade. So I just found it interesting that we have, it's really fascinating. We start with Bach and then we go to a modern contemporary piece and we end it with Scheherazade, which uh, is very, as I said, kind of dazzling orchestration. And I think you'll notice the Russian composers have a very special orchestral timbre. And there's nothing better than being in a situation of a live orchestra playing all that wonderful, beautiful orchestral texture. And I think this concert is going to just be a highlight. I really do. Um, Mr. Pratt, Jesse Montgomery, and Mr. Rimsky-Korsakov, again, will be performed on July 25th at 7.30 p.m. and on the 26th at 6.30 p.m. at Boulder, at Chautauqua Auditorium in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I hope you enjoy, have enjoyed listening to some highlights of the music, but it will behoove you to go online and find out more because these people deserve more than a few minutes on a Zoom. Thank you for listening.